gotta be kidding me. I can't sit in a multi-million dollar company and guess what an experience is like. I have good and bad phases. I basically put my heart on the line to solve a problem, right? A negative thing, I look at it as a pathway of options. What's the difference between you doing your a day-to-day -day job or working for your dream? But it's also about like really understanding what your true potential is. Again, you don't know what from your experience. How can a brand like Hugo Boss survive all of these years? You always got to set yourself up to adapt to whatever is happening in the world. You can't play blame game. What courage there is fear. How much fear played a role in your life? So we are here now. We need to get here. How do we get there, right? If you come up with a problem, you have to have at least two possible solutions. What is it that you regret most so far? Of uh, are we on? Yes. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> Mariley. <laughs> Can we start? Yeah, no, we, but uh, I like if it's a bit casual. Exactly. And fun, well, right? it is, like, it is casual and fun. Stiff, no, right? not too stiff. Nothing, Just nothing right, serious. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> You sure? Yes. Okay. We are. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. It is a pleasure to have you on our platform. Um, I'm sure your story is one of its kind and people would love to hear your, your story. So welcome to Brainsplat. Thank you so much, Roland and Brainsplat for having me. It's my pleasure. Excellent. Not sure if my story is one of a kind, but <laughs> it is see. one of a kind, and viewers will just judge on that. Yeah. I can, I mean, they will. So, never in my wildest dreams would I have guessed that someone would approach me because of working in technology, which was an unforeseen shift after 20 years in retail. But life is unpredictable, and that's a wonderful thing. It is. So what you did with this email that you have sent me, uh, which I really, really appreciate your feedback and your nice, beautiful words, you saved me a whole lot of work just to do an introduction about you, Morali. Um, this is why I said in as we started, your story is one of its kind. Um, it shows a lot of information in this small note that you have sent me. So... I want to get to this down the track, but let's start with the 20 years. Who is Morali? And where did we all start? Where did we all start? That, that's a nice question. Um, appreciate that because you never really get the time to reflect on your own journey unless you're getting asked, right? So I grew up uh, in Germany, as you can hear, I guess. Um, uh, I grew up in a family of lawyers and judges, so there was kind of a path for me, which was a bit like predicted by the family, but somehow it never really appealed to me. And I feel like if you have <laughs> millions of dinner conversations here anyway, it's still kind of a law degree just by listening to, to all the conversations. But yeah, I guess um, for myself, I decided I was interested in, in fashion, yeah, uh, which obviously is attached to retail. And So from law to fashion? Well, the lawyer, that was just what my parents thought I should exactly, do, yeah. <laughs> but not what I thought I would like to do. Um, so was it your own small secret or like you were... No, no, it wasn't, a... wasn't a secret at all. I mean, I, I guess like my parents probably had a base expectation. So, well, we are lawyers and, and judges, so possibly the kids want to become that too. Um, but I think I made clear quite early days that I don't think I will pursue this path. And that was totally fine. Like it's not, they, they never pushed me into a direction, even though my mom said, would be lovely if you would be a journalist and reading the news at 8 PM at night or something <laughs> like that. Um, kind of like make a nice little TV appearance. But, um, yeah, I guess I, I think, until I really finished school, I didn't really know what to do. Um, but I thought like, okay, I'm just interested in, let's say, the business world, interested in fashion and things like that. And I had a friend who worked for for a large retail, yeah, um, retailer, similar to David Jones, like what's called Pick and Kloppenburg. And he told me a bit about uh, their trainee program, which basically allows you to move through different departments and stations and 
get a really feeling on on how the whole complex retail system works together. And I guess that that was super appealing to me. So, um, so oh, that's straight after school, or no? That's um, now first went to university. I studied business economics, which I guess I've chosen in a way because it gives you so many opportunities, right? So you just learn about business in a way, but you have the opportunity to move into any kind of industry and um, various businesses. And I thought, okay, well, let's start with that, and then I can see along the way what what really interests me and and turns out it was kind of retail, which per se is a bit funny because when I started business economics, like they never told tell you about like retail or anything like that. Somehow it just back then didn't exist. Um and I was more like through my friends' comments or things like that. So I got interested in that and I went to um kind of a trade show where for for university students. So you go there and lots of companies present themselves. Um key objectives obviously to get young people interested in in their companies and and then apply for these roles and I got into a chat with the HR director of Pig and Kloppenburg so that's kind of a comparable company to David Jones and um there was such a nice chat and like casual and easy and I didn't know initially he was the HR director it's just someone standing around right yes um and yeah and at the end he said send me your application um and I knew they they take about fifty trainees a year for for this specific program, and and I got into it, and I guess that's that's how it all started. Mm. So from law to business to fashion, yeah. Which fashion is? <laughs> Which is fashion, fashion is business, and yeah. you need in business you need law. Which, uh, mm. It's a magical combination of the three. Yeah, well, but, I don't have any talent for a lot, to be fair. I just listen to endless conversations that we did out there. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, but your school didn't go like this. Uh, you told me like you had a lot of challenges, or especially with your math challenge. Where oh, said, yeah. oh, and this is a beautiful story just to tell. What was oh, the challenge guess, with your math? Uh, the, uh, no, I was, let's say I was never really good at math, but also not really bad. But when I started university, you know how Germany has kind of a ranking by state, which states are specifically good at math and things like that. And it turned out that my state was pretty crap. Um, and then someone said in university to me, um, oh, well, if, if you're from Nord Rhine-Westfalen, which, which the state... I went to school at you, you can't take math at your as your major subject in business economics. And that upset me so much that someone has like straight away an opinion just because I come from <laughs> this state. It seems to be crap at math. And I think that triggered something in me, like watch me, I'll prove you wrong. Um and I was like, I think I always had a bit of an attitude like Oh, there's nothing I can't do if I really set my mind to it. I can do that, and 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 so I chose math for business economics, and uh, obviously I succeeded. Fantastic. I wouldn't say I had the best degree in that, but I made it, and um, and I was really proud of myself. Just it just came from a very simple common. You can't do it if you're this and this. Like you know how people put things into your mind. Um, you can't do it because you're female. You can't do it because you're from this state. You can't do it because, I don't know, um, you don't have a talent for it. And and I feel like, to me, that's watch me up with you watch me, that, That's something I really dislike when people just make a straightaway judgment why someone can't do something. Yeah, and, and that, I guess, basically back then it wasn't even, I don't, it was not even like, I didn't really... I don't know if it was that conscious to me. It was more like triggering a feeling mm. of that's not okay if you say that to me this way. Watch me, I can do it. Fantastic. Yeah. So what's your message now to uh, the young kids, yeah. the new generation, who are going exactly through the phase that you went through during your school time? Yeah. Should they give up? Yeah. Should, they, should they, they just prove other people that they are wrong and just do it their own way? I mean, like, I'm not saying everyone needs to prove people wrong, right? <laughs> we could get messy all the time. But what I'm just saying is, like, do do whatever feels right for you, yeah? And, like, I feel like 
if anything, my key message is like, there's so many more things you can do than what other people tell you you can do. And, and even what you believe yourself, I guess, right? Like uh, we somehow grow up and we set in our ways and we have this opinion about what we're good at, what we're not good at. And I guess there's some black and white facts, but in general, I think you got to even really explore along the way what your talent is. No one knows that straight away. To be fair, like you don't know that going to school, what you should become later in life. It's it's a path of figuring out things. And and, and I truly believe challenging yourself is, is a good way to yeah. find out where your own boundaries are and, and what you actually can do. So I guess um, that's my key message. Um, if, if you fail, you have nothing to lose, right? You've taken a leap. You've given it a chance to try new things. But you try it again. Yeah. You try different stuff. So do you yeah. have to, what's the fine line between being stubborn and follow whatever you have in your mind, like follow your dream? <laughs> it's a very good question. I not the first time that I heard these two <laughs> words in combination. Yeah. Um, I, it, I guess. Let, let, let me just rephrase my question. <laughs> Is it good to be stubborn sometimes in life when you, when you actually just yeah. make your decisions and draw your path? Yeah, but I would probably call in that sense stubborn more resilient, right? Like put a certain trust in yourself that you can do things, right? And like you figure out straight away, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And that's totally okay. You just figure out, you know, where where's the right place for you in life. And, yeah. and stubborn in a sense, yeah, it, it does make sense every now and then. But it's also about like really understanding what your true potential is. Again, you don't know what your true potential is when you when you move into your first job or even when you start university. It's like, how do you know all these things you can do if no one ever gives you the chance to actually do it? Exactly. But is it okay to change your path? Is it okay? Is it normal? Or should we just keep on doing, repeating the same stuff every time, even if we're getting the same yeah. result? I'd say anything is okay, which feel right for you. Um, if anything, I do think it's a, it's a great opportunity to learn new things and kind of feed your brain along the way. You know, you can sit in the same job for 20 years if someone feels comfortable with that and, and feels like, you know, safe and, and develops a certain skill set in that area. So be it like that's fine for you. That That would have never been my path. But I do understand if people if people like that. So... Personally, I was always looking for, okay, where can I learn more things in a way like, okay, I know I already know how to do this now. What what next can I learn and what next can I learn? How so, can I improve myself? Yeah, no, improving. What is it that and I like, can learn? I think like me personally, I think I get such a tunnel vision being in the same thing stuck forever. And I do think lots of things take a couple of years to really build up a skill set, but then eventually you get to the point of, I know now what I'm doing. So what else can I learn? And that doesn't need to be business related. Yeah. You can decide one day I want to learn to become a good chef, <laughs> which I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was never that bad, but also never that good. But one day I just started, uh, thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice if I was a good chef. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Whatever it might be, just, just extend your skill sets. Fantastic. So in fashion, in, in business and in Germany, how was the experience in Germany? Great. I think overall, I mean, knock on wood, but overall I, I did have great experiences along my path. And that was not only for the companies I've been working for, but like people I really admired, like I had great bosses and, and like people in, in my area where I could learn a lot from. So, um, I love that. Like I moved into different roles, like after the pick and club book thing, I'm a one working for Hugo boss, which I always want to work like for, you know, strong brand learning more how, you know, kind of they distribute, they grow their business globally and things like that. So that was a great experience. But then I kind of quickly figured out, um, this is quite new thing, which is online, um, um, or e-commerce. And I just heard about Zalando, which nowadays is one of the largest global e-commerce companies. And I really, really wanted to work for them and really thought I've, I'm desperate to learn more about e-commerce business. Now I've worked 
learned everything in bricks and mortar. So what's the next thing? And I remember that a headhunter said to me back then, um, I'd be careful with e-commerce. It's not a safe thing. And I was thinking to myself, you bet it is a safe thing, right? It is the future. It is the future. And um, yeah, so I applied for Zalando and the, the first application didn't go through and then applied again a couple of months later and like different different paths, different person that went through. Um, I had an interview and that was super fun actually because it was such a startup world and like after Hugo Boss, which is like an established global, um, very corporate company, moving into that, I guess that was for me a life, light bulb moment because that's where I personally mm. fit in much better and was just fun. Every Like, you know, they had the very early starch office next to you was a pool table and then <laughs> in the next gym there was someone, whatever, playing on a computer got nothing it was all like seemed to be like wow that seems so cool i desperately want to work here hmm. and luckily it went out it excellent well, yeah excellent i want to go just a bit go a bit yeah. deeper in the e-commerce stage but just a question that came through my mind now from your experience how can a brand like hugo boss survive all of these years especially with the, all the fast change and movement that we're experiencing now, there's still a brand very well known and international renowned, mm. and people just look at them as a standard mm. in the fashion industry. How, how do they do it? What are their secret? I guess if it comes down to one word, I would say trust. They've built up a lot of consumer trust over the years of delivering great quality products, right? And I feel like, um, if you ask people who were boss, like what makes you buy boss again? It's like we trust their products. It's great suits and, and it's obviously a core area they're well known for. And um, that takes obviously years and years time to build up such a trusted yeah. name, right? Like if if you think about suits, I guess boss would be probably one out of three to five brands, which, which come up straight away in your mind. And yeah. I do think they do, they've done an incredible job over so many years to build up trust, to keep the trust and never disappoint customers. Like, you know, you can buy lots of things once, but what makes you come back is really, really the trust in a brand and, and probably the experience in a brand. And mm. um, I guess they've done a really good job with that. Okay. What about the niche market that you actually pick and choose? Does it play a role in, in your branding, in your product that you launch and you maintain through the years do you think if you pick a niche market versus having a product which is available to everyone mm. what do you think no, no, i mean and i guess the overall question is does it solve any kind of problem for someone right in a specific way and what solves my problem is probably not what solves someone else's problem but it's less about the market you're in if if you're doing good good job and better than anyone else in something there's a reason for you to exist in the market yeah yeah excellent so you jump into the world of e-commerce and it's a it's a very vast word and <laughs> start from somewhere and doesn't end um what was your experience in this field wild but really good mm -hmm. like Zalana was so early stages everything was chaotic no structures no processes but what we had was a massive vision and dreams and that what made it so exciting you know you're pretty much not saying the first one but one of the really early birds in doing something and you really think sky's the limit like mm. this is we want to become a global player in that um, and did I you guess believe we, in yourself back then, like as a team? Did yeah, you, I, did I you guess used to I meet did. and say, well, we're going to be the global player? This your attitude? Or I, 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 I do think that because I was very convinced about the concept. Um, and let's say other way around, there was no reason why I should not believe that, right? And, and I like the idea of having a very big picture and then make it happen. So we are here now. We need to get here how do we get there right and and i guess that's something um i love like really solving challenges and and make shit happen can i say that yeah well i can cut it but <laughs> i will leave happen, it of I course guess, um, 
that that's that's what I really like, you know. And like I've always liked working in a way. Don't give me tasks to do. Give me a challenge. Give me a goal, and and I'll work it out how we get there. And I guess what really inspired me again was the the big vision, but also the trust the Zalando had in their people. Like you could work totally freely and like just come up with a solution, never come up with a problem. I guess that was one of my key lessons um, along the way. My boss once said to me, if you come up with a problem, you have, to, like in a conversation, you have to have at least two possible solutions next to it. Or otherwise, else don't I don't, it. otherwise, I don't want to listen yeah. to it, right? And I guess that's how my brain got trained. Good. So I'm a very solution-oriented person. When someone tells me a problem, my brain switches straight away to what is a possible solution, whether that's good or not. But like you, you, you make baby steps in finding the right solution. And I loved the energy, and like that, that was right my place, right? Mm. Like it's almost like your little battery, and you go into an energy charger, and and then you find in the yourself. evening <laughs> they pop you out, and and uh, you're exhausted, but at the same time you're full of energy. Fantastic! Because, I love the yeah. German inside of you. No, you're yeah. talking engineering yeah. and structure yeah. and so no, on. That, that was the first thing which popped to my mind. <laughs> something which loads with energy. <laughs> so tell me something. Um, do you classify yourself as a doer? Or as an achiever? Or have you ever thought of it from a different... I think doing, you do something to achieve something, right? So I could do nonsense, which would not achieve anything, right? But I like tracking progress and seeing like the fruits of the labor in a way, right? So I do things in order to achieve things. And many times in life, you do the wrong things. You make mistakes, which we all know is probably the best way in improve to learn and to learn so i i'm definitely would consider myself as as both yeah fantastic so you jump into the world of e-commerce which is a word of technology again it's another field another vertical how much did you learn how much did you knew about uh, technology. I knew or nothing, not. and uh, you know, might be surprising. <laughs> I, I still don't know much about tech. You know, yeah. I guess. Uh, oh my god, there were like about hundred times when I thought I crashed the whole Zalando system sitting in front of my computer. <laughs> help, help! I, I've crashed the whole system. And, like, chill. That's not possible. But I guess um, it's more about understanding the problem and how technology can help to solve it. So that's. That's the way I look at technology. Like, so were you involved in the technical part? or No, more not like... really. It's more like, um, I mean, I've, certainly I've never built anything. And if you would tell me about building something in tech, I'd yeah. blank out. I uh, don't know. <laughs> um, it's more like, yeah, really using technology to solve problems, right? Um, and that's exactly the thing. Like, um, people can buy stuff everywhere. Take They can go to a store. But why why has e-commerce become so big because it solves a certain problem for people Mm -hmm. and in the first instance was probably the problem of a not having to go anywhere and and, then sit in a queue in front of a changing room or things like that um and then also b is very much availability of things they can get right so um you know back in the days you could get whatever was around in your village right and your mom would refuse to drive you to the next bigger town correct biggest can't be bothered um that's that's obviously e-commerce has solved that problem i can get anything i want from wherever in the world pretty much within a couple of days what's the negative side of e-commerce from your point of view like i personally i don't find i don't see people in shops anymore people talk less to each other there's no more sociable, direct sociable uh, skills that you actually gain. No, well, I, look, I don't look at it as a negative thing. I look at it as a pathway of options, right? Like mm-hmm. if you are going to the store, then go to the store. And I mean, how, what really does not relate to me is when people say e-commerce has destroyed the retail business or the store business. Like, I mean... This is just how the world is evolving, right? You can't say the car. So, has... is it true or not? Did it no, really not destroy true. that? It's or absolutely. Not? I'm like, I'd say it's absolutely not true because then you could argue that the car has de- destroyed the horse. Yeah, that's the world 
goes in evolution cycles, right? And we don't even know what's going on in 50 years time mm. or what is happening with AI, but you can't, you can't blame a new age and new inventions on destroying something else. That's how we move forward as people. Otherwise we would still sit in a cave Correct. and, uh, with, uh, and, and run out with a hammer to whatever, catch our own food. That's yeah. natural ev evolution. And, um, if anything, you always got to set yourself up to adapt to whatever's happening in the world. You can't, can't play blame game. That's yeah. So what does adapt means these days? Like do you have to accept everything and play the game or? No, no, you don't have to say, but it's more like you look at your own business model and think more the way, how can I benefit from the general evolution? Like, I mean, there've been retailers who have done like a fantastic adaption from purely being bricks and mortar to having an omni-channel business, right? And some of them too late, but whatever. Some of them did a great job. And now they've basically increased the experience for the customer because they can choose either way. Hmm. So whatever is happening in the world, stop blaming someone or something. It's just more, how can I use this to my own benefit? How can I fit in into a new phase? Hmm. Hmm. So from Germany... Uh, and the word of e-commerce, you, end you ended up in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask you the reason for your move because and I know the reason for your move. <laughs> but I'm not going to ask you the, the actual, the reason why you did move. Um, how different is Australia from Germany overall? Oh, yeah, I guess... Um... I guess my very, like, if I go back to my very first impressions was that I found the people much friendlier here and much more helpful and, and chilled, very chilled from my perspective, too chilled sometimes, yeah. but I do, I've like an easy example I noticed was like in the morning, if you would get a coffee in Germany, tea, whatever, and you sit in a line, everyone's like, hurry up, hurry up. I'm in a rush. Yeah. And so my first observation in Australia was like, everyone like, no, you go first. Oh, please. It's your turn. And I was like, that's really weird. And I, um, there's no urgency. Yeah. No, of, I don't know, but it's, I feel like there's just more empathy for, for oh, other empathy. people's situation. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm taking it too far, but that, that was my very first impression. And, yeah. and I mean, I used to live in Berlin versus Sydney. That's completely two different worlds, right? Oh. Um, but um, nowadays it seems to be ridiculous for me how I survived at minus 17 degrees because I complain if it's only 15 degrees. <laughs> <in Sydney. laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I love the, the, the beachy vibe and like a, I didn't know that before, but like, I think that's one of the best things. If you wake up and, and you're close to the beach, can take your walk, uh, can take your dog for a walk and things like that. Mm. It mm. feels like, for me, it feels really relaxing. It's a good attitude. Okay. Is it too relaxing or just normal relaxing? Well, I'd say yeah. I did have my moments <laughs> when I thought things could go a little <laughs> bit go a little faster, faster and a bit more focused, but, um, you know, Okay, so in, in the world of business, obviously, there are two different markets. And your experience in Australia and Berlin, um, is it you go first in business too here in Australia or how does it work from your perspective? I would say, well, that's probably a bit hard to judge. Like, I mean, obviously, the first business I was working for was the Iconic, which I loved that there was a similar atmosphere than Zalando. And again, for me, like um, years full of energy and, and big visions and dreams. So I would think, um, I'd say, I think that I do, which I probably didn't know before, but that I have a certain directness, mm -hmm. which was not perceived <laughs> that well initially in Australia. So yeah. I, I felt like it's more like, I'm very straightforward. Da, 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 da. That's what I think. But I don't, if people do that with me, I, I appreciate that more than, you know, dancing around the topic or yep. whatever they want to address. So I guess I got, I got told a few times, you gotta be Slow careful down, be careful. Your, yeah. But I, I think 
with the team I ended up with in the end and and I probably every almost every single one of them I hired myself I was always saying straight in the beginning look that's just how I am but I want you to be the same with me because I don't have the time to guess what you're exactly feeling or what you're thinking just be straightforward I never take things really personal so um I, I, that worked quite well but I think that was for me hmm. very different at the iconic than at Zalando, for example. At Zalando was like boom, 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 very straight. And while it's at the iconic, um, people are saying like, let's get shit done in a way, but it is a bit more dancing around certain So are they two different models all up? I, I, I just feel overall in Australia, and it's probably I'm comparing here two companies, yeah? One is in Germany, one yep. is Australia. I don't know if I can apply that to everyone else but i guess um i felt i have to be a bit more diplomatic here in australia <laughs> which is probably yeah. not one of my core strengths but but uh, isn't it e-commerce is all about the whole universe the whole world and you don't have to focus on into one single market you have to be open and discover businesses globally so how can you just can you have two different approaches with the same industry just because you are in two different places, in two different countries? Is this how you felt? or, or... No, it's like I think that was more the way of working, right? But like the approach like to the outside, to the customers, is very much the same. I mean, Australia is obviously challenged just by very high labor costs, by the, by the pure size of the country, getting things very fast from A to B and things like that. So, and then also if you expand here, I mean, where do you go to New Zealand? Obviously it's a logical yeah. step, but anything else is like so far away. So far away. For Zalando in Europe, it's like you'd rather look at Europe from a holistic perspective, not, you know, at the single countries, but whole Europe is smaller than Australia. So it's, it's far easier. Mm-hmm. So, what did technology do to you as a person? <laughs> oh, she's like, I love that question because I, I, I always claim that technology hates me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, I think I look look at it purely from, um, a, from a very pragmatic perspective. What can technology do for me to help my respective problem? But see, obviously it did make a lot of impact on your life. And you suddenly discovered a field that you've never been involved in and you excelled in. Well, I would, I would, I always put it this way because everyone's going out, why did you end up in tech? And I'd say, I didn't end up in tech as such, in like as a conscious decision. I figured out a problem which exists in e commerce and I was wondering and how I can solve this problem. Yeah. So it happens to be that this problem can be solved through technology. Mm. If it could have been solved through um, horses, I would be in a horse industry, yeah. you know? But I mean, um, it's... So it's isn't it like all roads will lead you to technology, technology these days? I've chosen to solve a problem, yeah. and that's that led me to end up in technology. So is it like technology is the only way you can solve problems? No, these days you can solve problems by negotiating and, and just talking personally. It doesn't need to be technology, but obviously, it's. I mean, the, this is just like as I said, like the world is evolving, and and we can do tons of things through technology. So, mm. um, in lots of cases, it's probably the fact, yeah, yeah, but yeah, okay. So I'm gonna ask you this magical question that everyone asks you as a woman in tech. Was it an advantage for you just to be in this industry or how did you feel really? I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's like that that probably goes back to a bit the university story. The the general assumption for people is you're a woman, you can't be in tech, but that, that and to be very frank, that pisses me off if, if people say that. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with my gender, wherever I am in my life. Yeah, uh, it is about what I want to achieve, what probably my skill set is, or whatever. Like, I mean, it, I guess this um, this obviously natural history of certain jobs which males feel probably more drawn to, or jobs which females feel more drawn to. So statistically, if you look at certain industries, there's a there's just a share of females and males, but 
I just find it really weird when people go straight away, oh, what are you doing in, in technology? And, mm. and why do So you do you get technology? asked this question? I do get asked this question mm. quite often. Uh, the same as I get asked, how does it feel to be a female founder, which I also find quite ridiculous. Oh, basically. my God. How do you feel like <laughs> <laughs> you are a female founder? Yeah, that feels, as I said, that feels exactly like being a male founder. I mean, what kind of question is that at all, right? Like, I I go through highs and lows, and I have good and bad phases. I basically put my heart on the line to solve a problem, right? And that's the same as a male founder feels. Like, why would it be different for me the way I feel it? Don't you feel really embarrassing that this question will come from educated people, people especially at this age? I do. If I like had how do they discriminate between to men? To give them and... a little clap, I would. But <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, but um, yeah, I just I the the whole gender thing. It doesn't. I don't know why it crosses people's minds straight away. They have to ask certain questions because you're male or female. Yeah. What? Why? And I, I just, me in my life, I never think about that. I never thought about the second, oh, I'm female. It's weird to be in technology. I acknowledge there's a, there's a lower share and, and, um, probably that has also a little bit to do with some kind of natural interest. Like maybe it's, it's just probably a matter of fact that, that males feel more, feel more attracted to technology as females, as it at least used to be in the past. But, I don't think it has to be a gender conversation at all. 100%, especially the gap in the salary between male and female, which is like really ridiculous. And what it's I've ridiculous. seen, it is still yeah. a huge gap in Australia. Yeah, it is. Like while we claim that we're improving and we're defending human rights and everything, there still is a gap. Which yeah, is no, really it, it, it is absolutely ridiculous. Like there, there is probably a price tag on things you deliver like a salary attached on things you deliver well, yeah. well, again deliver the same things like regards of being male or female 100 percent. so you, you went you progress in the world of uh, business and technology and everything and obviously you ended up in a very high positions in different environments different companies to the day you decided oh, i've had enough i need to go and solve an issue I want to solve a problem, Roland. I want to solve a problem. This is why I quit my job. I said, I need to solve this problem. Mm. Let's tell our viewers, what is this problem that you, we're talking about? And um, we progress mm. with that. Yeah, I guess like the overall problem is in e-commerce that people don't really know what is going on in their online store. Like uh, there is an NPS rating, yeah, which gives you a kind of a rough sentiment of how people feel about certain stages of the online journey. Um, but it's it's people we are asking biased people because they're already their customers, and you just get kind of KPIs or numbers thrown at you, but you don't understand the why behind it. And I like in in like when I joined the iconic and um, basically got tasked with growing the business to $1 billion business, right? Like obviously with the whole teams together. But my first question was like, okay, in order to grow a business, I can't just buy more product and expect people to buy it. I need to understand what people think about the iconic, um, what maybe holds them back to shop with the iconic, um, what perception they do have about certain parts of the overall online journey because obviously you need to make it as convenient and as pleasurable as possible if you want people to return that is very similar than a restaurant is experience like the core product of a restaurant is food but there might be 500 other reasons why you're not coming back whether it's dirty cutlery filthy toilets arrogant stuff god knows what so the in short there was like no detailed view of what people really think about the iconic about the e-commerce journey but also how the iconic compares to alternative solutions like people have the choice they can go and shop everywhere and then one day we were sitting in an exec meeting and um no we were sitting in a meeting and someone said wasn't it good old days when you walked into a store and you knew exactly what the experience was like you knew if the staff is friendly, if people can find whatever they need to find. You knew if the music is nice and appealing to you, if the light is good, whatever it might be, whatever influences someone's experience. Um, but yeah, and said, but no one knows really what is going on in an online store. And that 
kind of was a light bulb moment. I was thinking, well, it's so easy to send mystery shoppers through the store experience and basically um, capture their feedback and, and make um, recommendations for improvement. Why wouldn't be able? Why wouldn't we be able to do the same thing and have a network of online mystery shoppers going through the whole end-to-end -end experience and leave not only quantitative feedback but also qualitative feedback and really help help the business to understand where they need to improve and where they have friction uh, friction and where they have the highest risk of losing customers. And I guess that's when the idea of Humi was born. And mm. I, at, back at the Iconic, we were sitting in monthly exec meetings um, and literally taking good guess why the NPS score would go up and down. And I was thinking to myself, you got to be kidding me. I can't sit in a multi-million dollar company and guess what an experience is like. So I guess all these factors came together and I thought, okay, there's this idea and, and we could solve this problem for once and all, but mm -hmm. help anyone in e-commerce out there to get a, like full transparency across the whole end-to-end -end journey, give them recommendations, but really make them understand what they need to improve, what the experience is like and, and what people, how fe people feel about the whole journey. Mm. That's fantastic. And how are you progressing with the concept so far? Yeah, really good. Two years fast forward. So we basically kicked around ideas more or less two years ago and then built an MVP, like a product, which is very different to what we have at the moment. Um, but I think the key concept was there and we found retailers really loved the idea of getting deep insights into the end-to-end -end experience from unbiased people not not you can't you can't really ask your own customers mm. because it gets annoying to them um and they like the idea of really having the opportunity and possibility to benchmark their own experience next to their key competitors yeah because they could go like okay they can buy this nike sneaker from me or from these five others so i need to deliver a better experience mm. across the board so we found a couple of retailers um, who basically signed up and and then built the the actual product, which is a, which is like a platform. And I didn't build it, obviously, because yeah. I have no clue about tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this platform is live in the market since about nine months um, with about sixty five retail partners as of now in Australia. Um, with launched in the uk a couple of weeks ago and it looks like we're growing fast and it is on time because we solve a problem with almost which everyone in e-commerce has i'm gonna follow up with on Hume and all the best with this new project yeah. now question for you how well, you left a job and you followed your dreams what's the difference between you doing your a day-to-day -day job or working for your dream as well, I'd say Iconic was my dream at this point in time, so I don't want to sell that short, and I've learned a lot, but I guess it's a very different feeling now because, first of all, it feels great if you talk to retailers and they say, we see you're actually solving a problem we have. Mm. It gives you a sense of great achievement, and also, like, I'm just proud of that, right? The second thing is that you go back to being extremely hands-on because we are a very small team and then obviously we do everything ourselves. Like if someone asked me to paint the wall, I'm probably going to paint the wall. If the Let's say not asking me. Can you me, paint but, our wall? <laughs> <laughs> if the business is requiring it, I do it. And I love being hands-on for something which is kind of my 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 own yeah vision and, and, and dream in, in that sense. So... um. And I guess back to this full on energy, right? We have, we have such an energy. I wake up in the morning. The first thing is I'm excited about, I don't even know what's going to happen today. Right. So, okay. so and, it's and the mystery. That's such a good feeling. Mm. Like you, you wake up and you're straight away excited about something. And that's what I really love. Like it's, it, for me, it's a burning passion and it's, it's, like the drive I have to really make this a concept, a successful company and solve problems for millions and millions of people out there. And that's just exciting going through the whole journey and obviously the highs and lows and lots of learnings along the way. But now being in that position, I'm thinking that's, 
that's all I want to do. And I've, I'm extremely happy. I don't want to do anything else than solving someone else's problem. Look, it's fantastic. I think your story is very inspirational by all means. And your dedication is, is something you can teach for the new generation. What is your message to the new generation? The new kids, the new students that are watching you now, they're finishing, on, they're finishing off uni. They don't actually know which part they want to take. What is your advice to them? As a woman and as a person who has experienced different countries, different places. Yeah, well, I, 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 I let's skip to as a woman because I would give a general advice. I don't know. Or maybe if first advice is get off your phones and stop all with your social media stuff. Um, I do have a stepdaughter and a teenage years, and that really annoys me. I guess there are better ways to spend the time, but obviously it's hard to tell the kids. I guess if anything, I'd say the the best you can do is like just really being open minded and then look around and and learn along the way, doing probably some internships in different areas to really find out uh, out what you want to do. Because again. I guess it's just, it's a, such an involvement over time to find what really fits you, but also how you work as a person and feel like you could say, I love retail, but not every retail company is right for you. Like we all have like kind of different characteristics and, 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 and basically as such the company as, as, you know, their own heart and soul and not everything fits. So why do you need to find out what you really like to do? But also, what where, where do you fit in as a person, right? As I said in my example, I've always fe felt that I fit in really well into the startup world. But I found that out because I wanted to work for Zalando, not saying I want to work for a startup or something. Like It's like you just figure that out along the way. Again, saying that, try different possibly industries and areas, but also try to work for very different companies. Um and then eventually you really find the spot which is right for you um, and which really gives you the energy back, right? Because you don't want to be stuck somewhere and just think like, oh, it's kind of a half good job and the people are okay. You want to, you have to work for so many years in your life and you want to wake up and be excited. And I guess it can't get to any better stage in life. Waking up every day and thinking, I'm excited to work today. Mm -hmm. If you've achieved that, no matter what the job is, then you've probably achieved one of your life goals. Mm -hmm. Changing countries, changing jobs, changing environments, different verticals, lines. It takes a lot of courage to do that. What courage there is fear. How much fear played a, a role in your life? Or does it play any role in your life? Well, I mean... To be very fair, I guess I was lucky with that because I always came from the perspective thinking I don't have anything to lose. Like what he, I sometimes think what could ha possibly happen in a worst case, right? Um, the When I moved from uh, Germany to Australia, I thought, okay, if for whatever reason I don't like the company, the people, the, the, the country or whatever, what is the worst case? The worst case is I just move back and find a new job in Germany. Not a big deal, right? You'd think. Um, and then the the same when when we started Humi, I was like, I was just so excited and about. Uh, obviously, it's a very different situation because you come from a well paid job into a <laughs> zero, startup pay, zero. <laughs> zero <pay job. laughs> um, and uh, like, I mean, the, to be fair, you pretty much work your ass off, right? Yeah. Because it, it's it's not easy, you know, to get to a successful stage. But um, I guess I was then again asking myself, what could happen in the worst case? The worst case is we fail and I'd be destroyed and sad. But at least I've given it a chance and not many people do that. And I can say I've... I've taken the faith and the leap to do that, to really solve a problem for for a whole industry. If it fails, at least I had a time of my life. I've been working with the best people I could ever work with. Um, and I've learned so much being more entrepreneurial, possibly. So it, it's sad, but it still can happen. You know, we're an early startup. We've just finalized our first funding round. So... For now, we're good, but now um, hopefully you'll make it. And I, I strongly <laughs> believe in your product because of That's you, good. because I don't actually know much about your product, but I love your attitude and your determination mm. 100%. Uh, 
I'm not going to ask you of what is your achievement in life. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of achievement coming down your path. But what is it that you regret most so far? Mm. Of, I, I, that, uh, look, let, let me put it this way. I don't, I don't think I regret anything um, in the way, like, if, if I look at myself and my life now, I'm an extremely happy person. I feel extremely fulfilled. And like you could say, the sun is shining out of my bum. <laughs> in a way, I'm, I'm just happy. So if you get to a stage where you think everything is great in your life, why would you have any regrets, right? Because everything happened in your life led you to this stage. However, you could obviously always argue there are some regrets I have along the journey would be I shouldn't have never started smoking, for example. I'm not smoking anymore, but that was just a stupid thing, right? Like mm. maybe it has a long-term impact on my health, but like more like little things, but I don't think... So was it any decision that you made and you regret it? No. I've, I've, I've actually nothing. Fearless. No. You just. I don't regret anything. I honestly, not. Excellent. I know, that that's sounds pretty a good. Bit weird. And, um, I've, I've got asked that before a few times. And like, I've, I don't regret anything other than little things here and there. Oh, so I'm going to edit this, this question this if it was asked before. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to ask repetitive questions, but yeah, it's go really good just to see like your attitude is, and your determination is a lesson, is a story on its own. So if I want to go back to your village where you grew up, uh, Mariley, the young kid who had big dreams, is really Mariley now after all these years? Is this what you had in your mind all of these years or you always wanted more and more? No, I didn't have anything specific in mind, I guess. I I do think that I always thought, okay, I have a nature of wanting more like and when I say more I don't like I mean in the way like if I can do this I can get to the next level if I can do this I can get to the next level you know well why would why would I basically hold myself back if I can challenge myself and achieve more and I guess it's more like an overall feeling the the way I thought about my life and what I wanted to achieve I didn't have um any specific jobs or positions or things in mind um it was more like I can do things. I can do it. I can do it, you know? And like, don't, don't settle for less than what your potential is kind of, you know? So, and I think that's more my attitude. Why would I ever settle for less if I can do more? Um, and then sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong, but yeah. So what's your final message to all of you is who are listening to you now and watching you yeah. and watching your story? Because we start with uh, that your story is going to be a very interesting story. And I was betting on that. And I think a lot of viewers would agree with me. What is your message to them? Yeah, no, um, yeah, thanks for that. I like, it just, um, I, I like that you find it interesting. I never think on a daily basis about my own journey, but you know, I do have moments when I sit there and, and think, like, wow, wow, how how did this even happen? Like, you know, I'm like, as I said, like you approached me being guest in your podcast, um tech related topic and I was thinking not in a million years I would have ever thought that it's like I don't know it's like it's what why am I here because I've probably taken decisions in my life to a challenge myself but also to go with my feelings a little bit and to have this drive of solving problems and I guess that all kind of came together and that that's why I'm here so ultimately it's like if if anything, I'd say don't don't settle too early in your life and and put boundaries about you around yourself of what you can do and can't do. You know, good things will happen along the way to um to people who seek for it and like who give it a go. Just sometimes, yeah, just give it a go. And like again, like I know you, you we spoke about fear earlier, and I feel like again, I, I'm probably happy that I never had this fear, but I think. Like don't let any fears hold yourself back. Like the 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 biggest fear you can have is of not trying things, right? Excellent. Not trying things, just go for it. Fantastic. I'm gonna steal your words again, and uh, they, because they are really beautiful words. And I'll tell you, life is unpredictable, 
And that's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Roland, for having me. My Excellent. Pleasure. Thank you. Where do I start? I think it was a great experience. Um, for me, the key fact about the experience is that it felt really personal. And that we had the chance, you know, to to get to know each other before the actual podcast. What I really love is that that you're both involved and that gives me a sense of almost like family. It's like it it just feels sitting down and then having a, a casual nice chat, but also having a laugh along the way and um yeah, I think it nothing felt stiff or staged about it and that's what makes it really good. It's it's just goes in a flow and you're around lovely people and and obviously people who shower you with interest. That's that's always flattering. But um yeah, loved it being here. Thanks a lot. Previously on Brain Splat. A diplomat or spy would be a great way to America did truly believe the rest of the world. Obviously, South Korea was a challenge for them. Yeah. It was funded by a Dutch company that needed someone that could speak to So you crossed the bridge. I crossed the bridge. You never looked back. Yeah. Outside of Chicago, did not have a passport. So from diplomacy, espionage <laughs> to technology and IT. And invented with the philosophy, in the case of Microsoft, around... But how do I trust the output? Do I just take it? I mean, it's, it's going to have that black box element you don't understand. We're talking about executive sponsorship or playing the right politics with Some it? Some of the concerning uses of AI around upcoming elections. I think, are we doing enough to have our voice? Right? And I'm passionate about voting as an American abroad because... What do you see next for this industry? Then a lot of people get in from car sales to real estate sales into so IT as you're well. You're only as good as your next quarter. So you yeah. can still close a whole heap of business. And I know some salespeople that actually get depressed. What does it take you just to survive mm, in the corporate mm, environment? Unfortunate, but most of the tertiary degrees in cyber are, are really right. I think that happened more in the low interest rate environments. And you, and you remembered in the, in the 2020s and 2021s, you had AWS and Google and the major software companies. So you have to aim high and then just uh, reach whatever you can. So yeah, it's, sure. it's a hot topic at the moment. Many boards actually put as a number one agenda item these days. So oh. it's usually Australia, it's uh, Russia, it's China, it's North Korea, even Iran to some some extent. Is it the best way to stay alive in this industry or as well? What? I think the I think the secret is not burning your and it was just a conversation over a beer that, that you know got got us into that that business at the time. Depending on the role it, you know, at times it can be stressful. But... So when you say struggle did you do you have food to eat? At least three people had to die before trade aiding. <laughs> what happened to Australia now man after yeah. all these years? Yeah. The one thing they won't forget is how you made them feel. I mean no surprise that, that the the amount of competitors in the market shrunk. I heard it many times that this industry doesn't have any friendship. Yeah, I'd never envisaged uh, going to that, into that career. Uh, it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah, okay. Wrapped in plastic, um, you know, you'd grab a stack of six and throw it on your shoulder and run, run house to house. What kind of a person you need to be to be able to work in... Sometimes you have to. Uh, that's just the nature of the world we live in. You know, if you want to put a roof over your head, and food in your mouth, sometimes you have to do stuff that you don't like doing. You have your own thoughts or you have to work within the strict rules? Well, don't be afraid to go after your dreams. Yeah. I'm going to be the next billionaire. Yeah. Oh, billionaire. Okay. There you go. If you have the ambition that you just want to be the biggest podcast in Sydney, that's different to someone who wants to be the biggest technology podcast in the world, right? How do we base our strategy in scaling up yeah. if we have a new thing every day. Sometimes in a corporate world, the ambition is not there. After seeing it in media and marketing, TV, newspapers, we spotted what was going to happen to retail. Yeah. Do you think the Australian government is doing enough to help businesses in Australia? And so what starts to happen after the first year and a half, two years, three years, particularly in software is, and I think that's the number one thing that we get to too late when starting the business. The $10,000 over here on YouTube advertising, how is that? Our YouTube money? will love you now. <laughs> when, you, when you talk to people about new ideas, they'll always push you back or just give you yeah. the risk. And... and you ask the founder, who helped you? Who did you turn to when you needed to, when the moment was right? Who did you turn out to? They'll say either. They had a great upbringing, more traditional though, in terms of what women should do, what men should do, and what the roles are there. And Especially I, it just wasn't what I thought it would be once I was exposed to it. 
And to be honest, it was the money that made me want to go there first. Because normally, so what do we do? We sit back, relax, wait for things to happen, or is it time for Australia to invest more in research and development? Honestly, the women I've met in the industry are amazing. I think we all back each other, and we're kind of drawn to each other when we meet. Um, like the other day, I went to an event. Um, I know there might be just um, this is a hard question, and if you don't want to answer it, don't right. answer it. Do you trust these people? Senior leadership or board board level lenders are now personally liable in the event of a breach. I, AI and cybersecurity. Yep. What's the link between the two? Where's the threat? Where? Um, or is, is there any threat? And for me, I don't want to just think of diversity as having more females. I think race is important. You Being know, the people. Market. I don't know. I know it's a one billion dollar question. If you can <laughs> answer that. No, I don't know. Honestly, I wish I had a crystal ball. Bowen. <laughs>